option, leave a space, type in your contribution and name, then send it to 7197. Your views, our interviews on Spectrum, Radio 1 FM 90. Hello, a very warm welcome. This is Spectrum on Radio 1. I'm your host, Edmond Chizit. On Spectrum tonight, scaling up better service delivery. How is the URA making payment of taxes cheaper and convenient? The Uganda Revenue Authority is continuing with its modernization campaign, moving away from manual to digital systems as far as handling of most of its operations is concerned. These processes, according to the tax body, aim, at aim to ensure efficiency and the taxpayers can cheaply and conveniently pay their taxes. It was common in the past for taxpayers to queue for long at major URA offices, especially in Nakawa, to pay taxes, meaning that it would require a person to put aside most of their plans for several hours or even an entire day to simply pay their taxes. One of the new innovations at URA is the use of the tax identification, identification number through the digital domain. Although all taxpayers have been using the TIN as a requirement to become registered taxpayers, there are new developments that need to be taken into account now that the process is becoming digitized. There are also other innovations that have been made in the recent past that the public is still struggling to comprehend. Besides, the URA has also registered challenges in the past and it is important to understand what steps are being taken to stop challenges since the country needs more revenue to progress. So tonight, we continue looking at the progress being made by the URA in its modernization campaign and also how these changes will affect how you relate with the tax body in light of these changes. Our guests tonight, Mr. Anthony Mwanda, Manager Intelligence Tax Investigations at the URA. You're most welcome, Anthony. Good evening, listeners. We're also joined by Mrs. Dora Okuja, Manager of the Central Service Office at the URA. You're most welcome, Madam Okuja. Good evening, listeners. We're also joined by Mr. Michael Masembe, Officer in Charge of Tax Education in the Commissioner General's Office. You're most welcome, Michael. Good evening, listeners. Mike, what is the latest news from the URA? Uh, the latest is our motor vehicle registration and then our rolling out of East Stamp Duty, the module, all over the country. So we expect our clients out there to be able to secure the, the value of their documents but, uh, by ensuring that they pay for stamp duty into those documents and again ensure that if they have motor vehicles for which they haven't yet got the new logbooks that we offer for, to them, that they do get the logbooks. What exactly is this ESTAMP? Explain that to us. Uh, ESTAMP is uh, a module on ETAX that we have rolled out uh, uh, in the latest months in which uh, a taxpayer, any citizen of Uganda who has a legal document that they want it, that they want to be binding in courts of law, that they want not to be doubted uh, of the district, to be paid. You pay the value that uh, it, it is at borrowing and we have the rate. value of the transaction. Yes, it depends on the document as laid out in the stamps act. Some uh, have five percent, some have one percent, some have five thousand, some have ten thousand. So it depends on the kind of document that you want to, to secure. So you go and pay for the document, and then if it goes through the rightful, uh, for example, if it's a land title, if it goes through the Ministry of Lands, and they they back you up uh, through our system, the interface that we have, we are able to start to give you a certificate that authenticates that document. And how is the response so far? The response has been very good. Many people are coming up, especially those who know the risk that they run in the case they do not get these certificates from their documents. So people are coming in droves. People are coming in very much. There are talks about the procedure of getting this thing done. You walk into how do you do it? This ETAX, what is it? ETAX or ESTAM? Well, the ESTAM, but these all ETAX things. We're hearing about all these E's, E's. It talks to us about this. How do you get in there? Um, domestic taxes manages two revenue streams. One is the domestic taxes, the other is the non tax revenue. So, stamp duty, motor vehicle fees are non tax revenues. So, the non tax revenues we are collecting on behalf of certain other ministries, departments, or government agencies. Now, stamp duty and all other such do not necessarily require a team. A 
apart from motor vehicle, which is an asset, and you must register for a team. So the primary thing when using e-tax is to get the team first. You must register for taxes. Then there are other services like payment registration for non-tax revenues like express penalties or and then URSB also has their fees on. You don't need a team for that. All you need is your name and your location and you log on to the portal which is http colon two backslashes ura.go.ug and you will get the services available there. So what is the TIN? What is a TIN? A TIN is a taxpayer identification number. You get it when you need to interact with URA, particularly with taxes and with motor vehicle. And what do you get? What's the procedure? You have to know someone in government to get it or oh, tell no. us uh, if I'm a trader. <laughs> no, no, no. With the, with the coming of e-tax, really, you don't need to know anyone. All you need is two IDs, two, five two? recognized you two identification documents. Two identification documents? Yes. What do you mean? Two identity cards or a passport yeah, and a driver? Two identi yeah, two identification documents. There are five that we do recognize and there are about five others that are not really recognized, but we have to recognize them in light of the fact that we don't have a national ID. E-tax was based on the premise that the primary identifier would be the national ID and that hasn't yet come out. So we have to rely on the other five that may include bank statements for the last 90 days local ID, local LC1 IDs, association IDs. At times we have to add the financial card now. So, but the primary ones is the passport, the driver's permit, voter's card, NSSF ID, and employer's ID. Those are the five primary. So if you came with your passport, it's not good enough? You need to have one. Why? That's, that, that, that's strange. To reconfirm, because... Well, a passport, you go through checks, security included. Not always. Some people force their... Oh, talk to us about that. That's, that's a unique thing. If you have a passport, it should be genuine. Why would you question it at the URA is given by the government? As we know in this Uganda that we live in, generally in the world, there is a tendency for fraud. At times, we tend to take certain things for granted that I got my passport, but you don't know whether it was got legally or not. And this is why Michael was talking about stamp duty. Sometimes there are legal channels that we bypass and we get these documents. So to reconfirm that it's you genuinely, we do need two identifications that speak about the same person. This is also in absence of the national ID. If the national ID was there, it would be the primary identifier. But we must reconfirm both. And if you had the national ID, you would not need a second one or what? No. Ideally, you wouldn't need because we would interface with the national ID database and just pick your information. All right. Anthony, could you talk to us about this thing? Who, how, how do you get to, how does it work, and how does it make your life easier at the URA? Thank you, Edmund. The team is, is like your name, so to speak. If we, if I met you outside this place, I would call you Edmund. If we are to transact for tax purposes, your name is the tax pay identification number. So for you to, to be known by the systems, in this case the electronic tax system, you need to have a tax identification number. And uh, give us the procedure. Take us through it. What kind of people need it? Is it only the traders, the importers, exporters? Who needs it? Everybody who transacts with government to get the service of government and to some extent the services of local government. If you want to own a passport in the team, because the passport will require to, to go through government structures. If you want to get a driver's license in the team, if you want to import in the team, if you want to make a land transfer in the team. So anything for which there will be uh, fees collectible by the revenue authority, you would require a team. And how is it managed? If I have to get a driving permit, I need a tin. If I have to import, do I need a separate tin or what? No, no, no. It, the tin is universal. Once you register for tin, in the past we used to have the tin and then you needed an income tax number, you needed a VAT number. Now, under e-tax, the tin is a comprehensive identifier. In it, you will go through your portal. 
your portal is your window in wh- through on which the, the internet. Yeah, through which you talk to your own documents on the e-tax. Now you go to your portal and then you could amend and uh, change your taxpayer status. You can include other tax heads that you want to include on your taxpayer profile. If you do not expect to be importing, if for example you are a student who only wants to get a, uh, a driving permit and don't expect to be importing, then you don't have to register uh, for import taxes on your portal. So that team is your avenue. And whenever you wish to change the status of your, your team, you log on to the portal and then you amend your status to suit other activities. So team is your avenue. That's probably a, an easier language to understand. You get a team number, and every time you log on to the URA website, for whatever transaction, you use a team number. That's the name that you know is in there. Yes, for example, I, I will just elaborate. My name is Anton Mwanda. The way I spell my name is without an H. It's A-N-T-O-N-Y. But some people prefer to spell it with an H. And my, my name Mwanda ends with D-H-A, but some people prefer to spell it with D-A. But when you have a team which is uh, numeric, there is no chance of writing a two upside down or one the other way around. So the team is a primary identifier, a unique primary identifier, which cannot be changed. How many tickets? Ten. 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 It's a ten-digit number. Yeah. Ten digit. And for whatever you do, that's the number that you need. Yes. yes. But w- when you log in, you need a password probably to get in there, uh, do you? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, the moment you get the team approval mail, uh, when you apply for a team, we approve the team or reject, depending on the reasons behind it. But let's guess or let's assume that you have approved your team. We'll give you details that allow you to create an account with us. That is the interface something was talking about. So we have a window where you can see what we see and what we have about you. Every detail like you gave it to, uh, like you gave it to us. So in that way, you're able to communicate, send mails, do anything as you want it. And so... If you have a complaint, you can email it. You can. And we shall give you feedback. So the, the circumstances where you're not able to come to your area physically, or circumstances where you, you're a bit far out of the country cannot uh, cannot be right now ground for you not to communicate with us. And now, the other thing uh, that I would like to add to Anthony's was, you realize that we made our 10 pure 10 digit uh, before we had them as It wasn't well. alphanumeric, yes, it's, yes, it's it just simply digit. Yes. Right now it is pure numeric and that adds to the security component because you well, get alphanumeric normally is better. You have some numbers, you have some few letters here. Yeah. you go binary it's better we left it if you go into the language in which computers work it is secure more secure to have it pure numeric go on half numeric all right because uh, that is for secure on, uh, without digging into the computing and now that is the reason why we took it that way so systems regardless of which system or what uh, and the focus that maybe in the future our systems are going to be talking to other governmental systems so that's the reason why we basically and so do you have a central deposit of information? If I wanted to know the taxes I've paid since the beginning of, well, <laughs> since the last 10, 3 years, okay, would well, I get that information by simply... We looking? have a division, the Research uh, and Planning Division, which has every data that we have, that you would need to have. Well, but if I want to know it, I since I have an avenue to your website, to your systems, an, an now, interface, an uh, online interface. You know, it is creating, it is not secret that uh, at one time some people try to get into our system, so we try to uh, where you need information, you have those it. reports right. on our portal. You go under notifications, we have these reports for the data that anyone could be having. And the research and planning division uh, usually collects this data, and create it into a report that and is readable, yes, and then you can see it. But to get deep into the data that we use, you would have to come into our channels and you would have to grant your data access. That's well, this is Patrick on Radio Antonite, scaling the better service delivery. How's the URA, making payment of taxes cheaper and convenient. Our guests, tonight, Mr. Anthony Mwanda, manager intelligence tax investigations at the URA, Miss, Mrs. Dora Okuja, manager at the Central Services Office at the URA, and Mr. Michael Masembe, officer in charge of tax education in the Commissioner General's Office. You will be able to call in and contribute to this discussion. Dora, could you talk to us about fraud? 
then you get problems of people trying to break into the, some of these systems of yours, sophisticated as they might be. Talk to us about what's been happening. <clears throat> Now, fraud may not be the actual hacking. The kind of fraud that is coming in now is the one that is commonly known as identity theft, where someone will use your identity to create another identity, or where someone will continue to use your identity as if they were you, and you wouldn't know any better. This is common because Uganda, or Kampala, where I oversee, is a brokered community. So we tend to give a lot of information out to strangers that we don't know. And so we are trying to educate our clients about not letting strangers into our homes. So, What do you mean brokered community? When I want a team, and even if it's available on the portal, and there are URA offices all over the town, I would rather look for someone who's passing by and says, you know, you want a team? I can get you a team. So I'll give him my ID. Maybe we like my to passport. go through agents. Yeah. People are afraid of official dom, tall buildings. Of doing it by themselves even. Official dom sometimes can scare some people. The service is on internet. So you can access it from the comfort of your home. But we still have many agents representing people. So what we forget is that our IDs have sensitive information. My date of birth is on my passport. Um, the date of renewal of my permit is on the permit. My NSSF card has information about where I work. If I have a friend in NSSF and they get my passport, they can piece a lot about who I am. And these are things that the general public doesn't seem to see. So those are, that's information that's very, very sensitive. So this is the beginning of fraud. If you hand over your documents to someone that you don't know. Well, but if someone gets your ID, the only thing you interface with the URA is pay taxes. If they are going to pay my taxes, what's the problem? They may not necessarily. Oh, I mean, well, the question is, why would someone steal another man's your ID? Taxes. Okay. Um, the portal. Unless they want to help me pay my taxes. As I mentioned earlier, the team now includes motor vehicle, so I can transfer your car oh. to myself and drive it as you. I can um, log on because the VAT returns have schedules of your suppliers, they have schedules of people that you bought from, your income tax return has your asset base, it shows your land. There's a lot of sensitive information that's kept in the returns that you are is attempting to keep very, very safe, yeah? But which, if you give it out, it's open. So anyone who has access to your email address, passwords, password to your portal account, password to your email address, you're just out in the open. Anyone can use that information in any way that they seem they deem fit. You need to explain that to us, the theft, the theft of your idea, what does it open you to? You've spoken about it a little bit, expand it for us. The portal now is the main... When they steal your idea, what can they do? Explain that for they us. They can transfer your car, that is the biggest One, risk. they can transfer your car. Mm -hmm. They can access sensitive information about you and bring your... They can talk to, to your suppliers. To your competitors. Your competitors. Yes, they can sell the information to the media. But let's talk about, you said they could talk to your suppliers. Singapore sending you things and could, could they divert those things that are supposed to come to you? Yes, and they can divert them. That is another risk as well. If you have a clearing agent, he can see who, whom you order from, um, talk to you and say, when is your next supply coming in? Divert it. We've had those cases where containers have disappeared through clearing agents as well. So, so it is serious? It is very serious. Anthony, talk to us a little bit more about that. That sounds a bit scary. I thought if they still might like, not pay my taxes, so it's safe. Talk to us a little deeper on that. Yeah, but they are, for them to pay your taxes is one possibility, but it's one of the rare possibilities. Let me focus on those who still have the green logbook. The green logbook is what we call the analog logbook, logbook which has not been uh, digitized. digitized in e-tax. What happens is that you, Edmund, uh, have this logbook of your Mercedes Benz, but I, Anton Mwanda, will go and create a team called Edmund. And I'll go through all the requirements as established by the team portfolio. And I will get a new logbook for your car 
with your name but in a, a portfolio which I own. Then I'll go back to the team in my portal, to Etax in my portal, and I'll transfer that card to Dora. And she will get a new electronic logbook in her name for your car. And then I, I, I could dispossess you of the car. But most commonly, we have had very many complaints, people complaining that I have gotten an SMS on my phone saying that I have paid taxes for goods which I never imported. That means that you could have three micro assemblers in Kampala who do not know each other. But their date of birth is different, their mother's name are different, and all those are unique identifiers which are recorded, which are required before you get the team, the new tax credit. That's the mother's name. Exactly. Among others, the mother's maiden name. So what happens is that either the fraudster or a careless credit agent will choose any one of the micro assemblers that he has found and use those, any one of those names to declare for importation of goods. Take the incidence that this is a fraudster. He will get your goods, he will pay taxes. The taxes are only a fraction of the cost. Take, the, <laughs> take ownership of your goods. After paying a small thing. After paying 10% of the value. Maybe 10% of the value. He will take them, he could take a truckload of things. Absolutely. He pays taxes worth 20 million, he takes yeah. property worth 400 million. Absolutely. So that is the risk to which we are exposed. And that is why people need to take very keen interest in protecting their identity for purposes of getting tax by identification numbers. Michael, how, how does it happen commonly? How do people actually steal? Or do we have sharks out there waiting to steal people's passwords so they can, you know, rob in this manner? The worst, uh, the best that causes uh, the major scenario in which people find themselves in not control, to a control their team, is when they try to delegate authority without knowing the barriers or the limits to which this authority over the team must be delegated. I'll give you a scenario. Someone gets to the border. Uh, all they want to do is to see their car or their container inside the country. They don't care how, but all they need is a team. Okay, that person will try everything, and then he runs into the hands of this dubious person. Let me call him in quotes. And then they'll tell you, I'll get your team. And now, for speed purposes, let me use my email address. And for right. purposes of speed, <coughs> let me use my phone number, because when these URA people call you, right. you will not know what's going on. So let me use my details. And now, they will maybe create a team in your names, but when the they actually details are not yours. Mm. Yes. yes. And so, this is what has happened, actually, for most people who are coming to register their motor vehicles right now. Yes. They got teams previously, in other ways. But then when you get to a point of telling them, check your email address, they will tell you, I don't even have an email address. And then you ask so all men and women we should have their email, should have email exactly. addresses. Now when we check In this system, modern day and age. Yes. When you check the system and you ask him, is this your email address? He tells you, I don't have an email Now in those cases is when you tell him, you know, after identifying him properly and authenticating that he's the genuine owner of his team, you can help him create a new email address and then your name such that further communication is to, him. is to him. Now that's one of the scenarios. The other is about this negligent shared information. People ask you, do you want to, uh, what do you want to do? I want to tell you. Use my team, especially those people in Kotu. You give out your team without knowing the repercussions. You give out the team and we see your team in Kotu and actually it's not you who is important. <laughs> we think you're important. We'll talk about that a little bit more. It sounds rather intriguing. This is Spectrum Radio. We'll go for a break. We'll be back to stay tuned. He will follow the wild this Valentine's with Reds. Buy Reds and win a getaway for two to the Wild Waters Lodge, plus other amazing prizes. See press and posters for details or visit your favorite bar or supermarket. Happy Valentine's Day from Reds. Crisp, clean apple taste. Not for sale to persons under 18. 
Uganda Communications Commission is currently conducting nationwide mandatory SIM card registration. Register your SIM card in a few easy steps. Visit your telecom operator's customer care center or any other designated registration center and provide your phone number, a copy of a valid ID or any other valid ID with accompanying photographs such as a passport, driver's permit, voter's card or a letter from your LC. Information on your physical address or residence will also be required. SIM card registration protects mobile phone users from incidences of fraud, incitement, terrorism, and hate messages, among others. Please note that SIM card registration is mandatory, and those who fail to register risk having their SIM cards deactivated. The registration deadline is 1st March 2013. All information shall remain confidential. Let's make communication safe. Register your SIM card today. Spectrum on Radio 1 FM 90. Welcome back on Spectrum tonight, scaling a better service delivery. How is ERA making payment of taxes cheaper and convenient? Our guests tonight, Mr. Anthony Mwanda, Manager in Intelligence Tax Investigations at the URA, Mr. Dora, Mrs. Dora Okuja, Manager of the Central Service Office at the URA, and Mr. Michael Masembe, Officer, Commissioner General's Office in charge of tax. Education, you will be able to call in and contribute to this uh, discussion tonight. Michael, talk to us about this after the, of, of, of your a month's password, a month's team. Yes, Take us through it once There again. are many scenarios in which this password routine could be lost, uh, and it calls on uh, the vigilance so the owner to, to really be very keen when dealing with their transactions. For example, if someone was actually dealing with URA, we know that uh, the password is really critical when you're dealing with us. I don't know why someone shouldn't browse in a private. We have that uh, option when you're dealing online. Private browsing. So it means whoever will come and log into the machine, especially if you're working in a cafe, will not be able to detect your browsing history. Those scenarios. Everyone who is looking over your shoulder while you're browsing, we, we have that, uh, we call it shoulder browsing. I'm not looking into your computer just for purposes of looking through. I, I could be looking at w where you are and someone who's so is at this time. Then the cache in your, in your computer, there are many scenarios. So your computer or your team and password have high risks. But again, we cannot say we are going to stop doing this because it is creating, if there is too much fruit that we're getting out of this than the, the risk that we are running. We are encouraging you to use our services, but at the same time we are asking you to be vigilant because what you're trading online has a lot behind you where you can lose. And so we ask the people, don't just leave out your team. Don't, don't think that whoever is important and you give them the team to use just to ensure the goods cross over. It's not an innocent thing, yes. a one-off. Yes, it's not a one-off. It creates a relationship. It's not a one-off. And you said something about an email address. Some yes. people think, you know, email addresses are for young people. They should exactly. not have email addresses. Exactly. Uh, the email Is it important in tax payment? Or is, can it be a security buffer? I'll give you a scenario. Uh, when you read uh, the way a Google account is created, like the Gmail account, yes. there is when you're asked to put a phone number, yes. in which a code is sent. And an alternative email. Yes. You put a phone number, and then they send a code there. And then after you create an account, now, do you know that that code that is sent to a phone can be used by any hacker as an alternative password? It's kind of a key, actually. Exactly. So now, there are those things that we take for granted, but that can turn out disastrous to us. Cookies within our browsers. Cookies. Uh, Explain cookies, what everyone might understand. Cookies, uh, it's, it's when you're browsing, so because our services are online, yes. but there is the default setting, which I'm going to talk about today. The default setting most of the browsers that we use is that they will store. Yes. They will store. The history. The history. The browsing history. It's like that the next time you come back to the page, it won't bother you. you okay, it's good because you won't bother most times. You remember things. Uh, and all the the remembering the link on which you are, but at the same time, you can come back against you. Setting it's a shared computer. Exactly. Setting your preferences to the default. If you know I'm working on maybe on the URA page, I'm going to take it to private browser in the first place and then delete browser history because you know the password. And if you're creating this password, don't create a password with any word in the dictionary. Oh. Don't. 
don't. As long as you know the word cow is in the dictionary, don't because anyone it's a natural, it's a natural word. Right. Create it as W O C because these a natural, people, a natural anyone who intends to steal your password, there is what we call the, the dictionary and hybrid technology that can be used to fit the the scramble text, they run it using the words in the dictionary and they can easily guess this password. Now you have to use this. You, you have to use words also outside the dictionary that would help you. We are trying to talk about a password that is hard to crack. Not your wife's name, for instance. Not instance. your wife's name. But if you're using your email address, like I said, do not use this. I mean, do not use an email generic address. Generic one. Generic one. Use the email address for email for your services that you know that if I'm using it, it's not the one that I share with other people. I've been happy about people. Oh, you could have a secret email. Is that what you're exactly, advocating? Exactly. I'm happy about people or organizations that have seen that have created a separate account for your business. It is not to be accessed by anyone. It's like a secret email. Exactly. It's it's like a secret mobile Let number, which is not on your business card. Exactly. Let it be purposeful for that. Not an email which you call and you give uh, your secretary, because we know the biggest, one of the biggest threats are the people in your very organization. I'm working here, I know the team of my organization, I know the password of my organization email. Those are the biggest threats, because the, the best person who can do you the worst is the person who will. Dora, talk to us about this email thing. So, people have to have emails these days. It doesn't matter how many careers you have. It doesn't, it's not about yappies, young and professional, young people. It's for everyone. If you go to pay taxes, for instance. Very true. The email is now the new post office box. Every man must, must have, have an email. An email. All capital letters. If you can't be on Facebook, if you can't be on Twitter, that's okay for now. But you may attend your grandchildren's wedding via Skype. <laughs> yeah, that is coming as well. But email addresses you must have an email and Google at least is coming up and putting it in local languages you can browse Google in Uganda and Kinyaranda and I think I saw Luo at some point so Chris I'm very sure that we are about to get there so in other languages yeah and you need one email address so address for uh, the URA transactions yes we have only one email address and that's the one that we notify we notify your portal account and we notify your email email address. If there is any change to the password, it's notified to your email and in future when we get the phones on to your phone. But what is happening is when you nominate someone to get a team for you, they will put their phone number and they will put their email address. Fine, you have the team, you're looking at the certificate, but you're not communicating with anyone. So the next thing that happens, which is what we're seeing now, is you come up and you have a VAT liability of over 500 million. And you don't know about and it. And you didn't know about it because you've been giving this man money every month to pay. And he goes and does And he goes things. and does, maybe builds his own houses and starts becoming a landlord wherever he is. And he's been declaring you as someone who's claiming. So you have an offset of over 900 million. And you are asking, where is this stock that you're keeping? And you knew nothing about this. Why? Because you gave someone the authority to manage your tax matters. Go if on. you are going to delegate your tax matters, to someone, like appoint an agent. We have four more channels. You can nominate a tax agent online and they are, we are now registering tax agents. So we vet them, we train them, we monitor them, we ensure that what they're doing is okay and we also notify the clients in case we find that something is wrong. Similar to how we are managing clearing agents. We can't strike them off and we well, I mean, their I, license. I, I was just, want, just wanted to know, you people want to put them out of business, clearing agents, what are they going to do now? No clearing agents must be compliant as well. They well but they don't need your TIN number, for instance. No, they have, they have TINs. They have, they have access. We have, they have their own access. So when you nominate them as an agent, they get um, certain notifications, but not all. There are certain things they shouldn't see. We can remind them that you're due to file a return. We can remind them that you, you're due to pay. We can notify them that we've uh, received your return. But they shouldn't have access to, like, your motor vehicle. What do they need it for? So there are certain functionalities that are restricted for agents and others that are open to you. And then, if 
For any reason, you deem that, ah, you know what, you are a just disturbs me, you manage. Yes. Make sure you know how often you interact with URA. If you are an importer, get daily updates. We notify you about your imports, your payments that you have made. We notify via you the about phone. the returns that you've paid via your portal, via your email, via your SMS. SMS notification is not yet up and running, otherwise it should be the best. But you must make sure you know at least every single day. You must ask him, how what has come in? Every day. Yes. Log in. Log in and 50,000 for every for every phone call. Well, then you come to URA. We put service centers all over the office. The most recent one is the one at Diamond Trust. We are also doing mobile offices. Please come and we will help you to access this information easily. Actually, give us some more clarity on that. Clear engagements. How do they differ from the guy you meet at the border? Well, clearing agent primarily is um, is licensed by the Revenue Authority to assist in conveyance of goods which are declared for import to Uganda or transit to Uganda to another country. Now, they are the only ones who are mandated to transact with URA. So, you, the importer, must appoint in writing the clearing agent. And upon that instruction, the clearing agent will be entered in the system as somebody who can transact for purposes of transiting these goods. Now, many times, um, there have been instances where clearing agents, for one reason or another, negligence or outright fraud, or somebody you know playing games in the back office, they lend their authority, their stamps to other people who may not be authorized to transact with URA. For that matter, um, they will claim that Anthony Mwanda has authorized them. They will get a document with a fake signature, which may not be verifiable by the customs office at the border, and then goods will be released to this agent. They could be released uh, for domestic consumption, or they could get lost uh, through transit. But um, uh, that has not been the primary cause of why they're having problems today, but that is part of the problems that we face with the clearing agents. So you have a list of certified clearing agents? Yes. A clearing agent must get uh, certified at the end of the year. How many are there? I wouldn't know how many, but um, they are licensed. Is it a long list or is it a short list? No, it's a long list. 25 or more? No, no, no. 200. Hundreds. Hundreds. Hundreds, okay. Hundreds. And uh, you certify them, you give them certificates. Is it, do, do, do you publish the list on the website? Yes, we publish, we publish a list. All of them must apply for renewal of their agency license at the end of the year. Every year. year. At the beginning of the year, the Commissioner for Customs releases a list of clearing agents who are authorized to transact with the URA During on behalf yes, of, of, of their clients. But with time, issues arise, goods might remain outstanding. For example, you have authorized the clearing agent to exit goods from Malaba to Katuna, and the lorry broke down along the way. So seven days later, you don't see the, goods. the goods haven't crossed. So we will suspend that agent until he tells us where the goods are. Seven days? Yes. Seven days. Only, only seven days. Seven days. Uh, in which very patient people. No, no, no. It, has, it, has, it used to be much longer, but now. But I must tell you that uh, my background, uh, what I do at the URA is about fraud management and abuse of uh, taxpayer rights. We have people who cut hinges off trucks and uh, empty the trucks and then weld the hinges back. So we must keep such a tight, a tight deadline between import and export. So there's no time to weld. Yeah. And break seal. Presumably, yes. So that's why we keep them on a tight leash. But if they don't account for goods, then we'll suspend them from working with URA until such time when they can show where the goods are or when they cannot we will ask them to pay for the taxes for the goods which got lost and is it a common thing does it happen a lot uh, it is a management practice a typical management practice it is a the carrot and the stick if you play your game well then you won't get suspensions but you get a lot of people in trouble right? yes we do 
Yes, yes, we do. It is, it is common. There are people who come in and uh, bring in cars and they claim that this car is going to be re-exported to Congo. And it vanishes. The, the car may not go. <laughs> the car may not go, but then somebody will get a fake document and claim that, you know, these documents went to the border. They were stamped by the officer at Oraba or whichever other border, whereas the documents did not go. So what happens? The claim agent bears that responsibility. It works well for URA because you only have good capacity to run after every taxpayer. Imagine there are hundreds of thousands of taxpayers, but we have a limited number of claim agents through whom we can have full visibility of whoever trans transacts. So some of these things, you cannot do them yourself. You have to get a, a clear agent. Basis. Yes. That's like re-exporting of cars. What else? Re-exporting of cars, importation of goods. Uh, there are, for example, companies which are doing our roads, foreign companies. They come in with trucks, brand new trucks. And they need to re-export them. And they need to re-export them. So those have to be secured by a bond. The bond is entered by a claim agent for a known period of time. When the construction period elapses, they will come back and then re-export their vehicles. So you don't tax them as they bring the equipment? No, we don't. And we give them special uh, registration. They have red number plates. Those are temporary imports. So they will, after the period of construction, if they wish to use the vehicles in Uganda, then they will apply for and get the regular number plates, the black number plates, and they'll be pay taxes on those vehicles. Otherwise, they'll take them out of the country. So whenever we see a red number plate, that's a car that's supposed to be in. No, the red number plate regime covers very many vehicles. There are people we call returning residents. Yes. Those are Ugandans who are returning for good. And they are they, they allowed one vehicle. And they are yeah, allowed a vehicle if they are coming back to stay. But then there are also diplomatic missions, NGOs, there are special purpose vehicles, garbage trucks, excavators, cesspool trucks. Those also might benefit from the red number plates regime. All right, let's hear from the listener. This is Bertram on Radio on our number 0414 You can call these people, tell them what you've been going through with a clearing agent or with their portal or any the office that you try to interface with. They are experts. Anthony Mwanda, Manager Intelligence, Intelligence Tax Investigations, Dora Okuja, Manager Central Service Office, Michael Masembe from the Commissioner General's Office. Talk to us a little bit more about this logbook. You are abolishing the valuable logbook that people used to borrow money. What are they going to do now? You are required to, to get the digitized <coughs> logbook which is issued through the E-Tax uh, Motor Vehicle Register now. The old logbook, which uh, the green logbook, <coughs> is no longer a valid document. Well, it is a valid document which is phasing out. For purposes that does not grant you the security envisaged under E-Tax, it can be abused, and uh, some institutions do not accept it as um, a valid document, especially those institutions which would lend you money uh, when you secure using a motor vehicle as collateral. So you are required to move in and transition your motor vehicle from the old register until you get the new electronic um, logbook. Uh, people have had issues with electronic logbook because of the way it is carried. Uh, yes, it's just, uh, l let's get some details, Michael. Talk the to us about that. The reason has been uh, printed majorly in the electronic logbook has been its... Uh, the weight cannot be durable and the, the features with it. What does it look like yeah, the electronic law? Numbers, on black it's and white. On an Nothing paper. fancy. But uh, what we really mind about that paper is the serial it carries. The serial. Because uh, that paper carries the content that we hold in our system. And if there was any scare... The chess's number, engine number. Yes. If there was any scare anyone had about the, you know, the value of the vehicle that they had, or the kind of vehicle that they had, before doing any transaction, I would advise that such a person to come and make a search at your vehicle. Because even if you had this green hard logbook, they can make it. It can be made at NASA, or anywhere, with anyone with good stationery. They can. So what I would advise for you to be sure the paper is not enough, come and make a search at you already. All right, you'll be, you'll be sure. Hello. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Your name? I'm 
Martinez. Is it only people from Barra who do those things? Why? Why? Yeah. Okay, Spectrum, hello. Yes, your name? Ambrose. Ambrose, yes. Your name? Yes, it's Mukama, Mr. Mukama, yes. I wanted to know what the Okay, let's get those answers, intriguing questions there. Michael. Oh, yes, uh, I will talk to Martin from Nakulavie, who was trying to apply for a team today. The general support is from Barara. Is it only people from Barara who normally That scenario happens when you do not enable macros when you're beginning to work on our templates. So I would advise Martin to when he opens that form, there is a security warning to enable macros. You should click it and click OK to enable the macros. Others will say Barara. Go on. Yes, and where he finds the drop down menu, please check the details from the drop down menu. Do not type in. Yeah. If we give you a list of Kampala of all the districts and you choose to type the, 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 the district with yourself other than picking from the list, it will not work out. Well. So, so it only limits, limits you. Do you have a menu, drop down it's menu? Procedure. That's all that's available. Yes, it's procedural. You go step by step. You choose Kampala district, then you choose the, 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 the Kawente division, then you go on choosing the uh, down down. down. So Martin might have missed, did not disable the macros. That only happens when you, you don't. Know. He didn't enable the macros. Maybe I can explain a bit about what macros are. Macros are special instructions that are built into Excel templates. And in our case as URA, we put them in to ensure that we get standardized information. So if you don't, if you neglect to enable them, it means that you corrupt the template. And that means you can't use that template again. We did this deliberately so that we don't have to keep reworking every case of application and to ensure that the information comes in and we are able to process all applications within two days at least. So I request Martin, please go back to the portal. There is a guide how to register for taxes. Follow it step by step. The enabling macros guide is within the template itself and it shows the different versions of Excel and how to enable for each of them. Thank you. Yes, and this gentleman, Ambrose. Ambrose. Okay, about Ambrose, uh, I'm happy with his comment uh, about the, the guidelines to uh, usage of computer security. Uh, we are also happy to tell everyone that uh, we had the Computer Misuse Act in 2011, where anyone who has unauthorized, uh, unauthorized access, modification, interception, and obstruction of any kind of information from a protected computer. Yes. And from this Computer Misuse Act, they are protected computers, include those that are run under Uganda Revenue Authority, because we provide a public service. 
senior at the center. Yes, when you look under that act, section 20 defines the protected computers and our kind of service and our, and our information systems and this category. And we hope that every Ugandan out there is taking time to follow the direction that is given in that act because the, the repercussions to not following these procedures, the repercussions to maliciously use our team for your own purposes are really, really strong. Okay, but we are happy with the uh, ISACA for their initiative and we hope in the future. You know about them, it's a certified course. Yes, yes. Let's talk about this gentleman, uh, Anthony, Mr. Mukama. He says uh, he wants one motorbike, he probably never interface with you again. What should they do? Well, to Mr. Mukama from Uganda, my advice would be to um, people like Mukama. I want to assume that Mukama owns this motorbike and it is a means of livelihood for his home and uh, his family. Additional security to that motorbike would be registered motorbike in his name as Mukama. I did not get his, last, his first name. But for Mukama to have that bike registered in his name, he needs to acquire a team. Acquire a team and then bring in the, motor, the, the motorcycle and register it as a motorcycle with all the particulars and it belongs to Mukama with his unique tax identification number. If he needs to, if he, should he buy a second and a third motorcycle, all of those are secured within in his name. Under one tin. Under one tin. He doesn't need a second or third tin. He doesn't need a second or third tin. And doesn't have to pay taxes for that. The tin is free. Oh, the tin is free? Absolutely. You don't pay even a stamp duty for no, it? No, 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 no. The tin is free. And you say he needs an email address. These old men, you want them to learn passwords and things like that. Mukama needs uh, an email address because that is the only avenue for him to get the tax identification number. No electricity stops in certain towns, doesn't go very good. We have what we do for we have um, a domestic access office in Uganda where we can even help everyone of our clients to secure an email address. Oh, you can give emails we at help URA. you to create an email address if you don't have one, and we help you through the process of team application. Now, us bringing these e services did not mean we closed the office. Our offices are still open for anyone. These e services are for the comfortable headman in his office whose job cannot give him space to move into the URA offices between 8 and 5. You can do this online on your computer. But if he's someone in the village and he has access to all of our offices in the local township, he has this opportunity. So they can come to your office and manage their email very, account. Very, very. Just one more thing for, for Mukama. Yes. The aggravation involved should Mukama lose his motorcycle. It's a big risk. Yes. To a fraudster, a codeman, he is much more greater than the, the trouble he will take to get a, an email address and therefore a team. So an email address is basically a risk management. It is, it is your second identification. Risk management. It is your PO box address. You need it. Yeah, you need it. You can't avoid it. In this day and age, you need it. We have to go on learning things tonight. Without an email address, you might not be able to go very, very far in some of these things. Thank you very much, Lida, dear guests. Mr. Anthony Manda, Manager Tax in, in, Manager Intelligence Tax Investigations at the URA. Thank you for coming to Spectrum tonight. Mrs. Dora Okuja, Manager of the Central Service Office of the URA. Thank you for coming tonight. Mr. Michael Masembe, Officer in Charge of Tax Education at the Commissioner General's Office. Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host, Edmond Chisto Spectrum. We'll be back tomorrow. Up next is news in English. You are losing your MTN number if you don't register by the 28th of February 2013.